The event box passes up to the analysis box, and that's the kind of thought process, that's the pattern matching, or the signature matching, or the statistical anomaly, or all of the, the cool buzzwords that sell boxes. Um, we have a countermeasures box. This is really interesting in the IDS terms, because we presume, and, and rightly so, that an IDS is a passive part of a network, um, but they do have false positive that ever happens. That's the countermeasures box that's doing that. Um, we can have a lot of fun with that, by the way. Um, the other box that they do have here is an S. It's actually D, a D box, a storage box. Well, what's, you know, data's useless if you can't access it. And that's the whole point of a D box. So we have an E box, an A box, a C box, and a D box. Um, the jobs are pretty self-explanatory, but if at any time you forget and, and I'm talking about it, stick your arm up, I'll try and remind you, or you could remind me. And if we see in a typical deployment, we see very two typical sort of deployments in an IDS situation. We see a typical detection uh, configuration for an IDS system, uh, which is we sit on the inside of the LAN uh, and we see threats that are happening well, we sit just before the LAN, so we can see threats coming, uh, going in and out of the LAN. Really, really good at seeing what attacks are happening to our host, you know, to our, to our network. Really naff at seeing stuff that's happening on the outside, because it's just not configured that way. And we have an, atta uh, an attack detection configuration, which is our IDS system normally sits on the DMZ just before the firewall, so that we can see the threats that are coming to our network from external sources. You've guessed it. An attack one is really crap at telling us what's happening internally. Uh, really good at telling us what's happening outside, but really naff at telling us what's happening inside, and vice versa. Um, but bearing in mind, we do see vendors that have this one solution that fits all. So obviously they know something that we all don't know about how you can detect and defend both sides of the coin. So. Host versus network, it's always good. I'm going to be talking about networks today, so you count yourself lucky because the host stuff is just really boring. But uh, sorry if there's any host based guys in, it's not personal. <laughs> but a host intrusion detection system has a plethora of information that it can rely on. I mean, it's got all the information that a box has. So it, it's got syslogs, it's got you know, uh, network connections, blah, 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 blah. Anything that you can get the OS to tell you. It's got, well, obviously it makes it susceptible to, uh, you know, rootkits and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it can tell you the information that it has on the box. I'm presuming you've just worked it out. <laughs> um, a network intrusion box, um, well, the only information that uh, uh, a NIDS could go for is uh, raw data on the, on the wire. Um, which is awesome. It gives it a really good perspective about what's happening on the network. But it's not really capable of telling anyone what's happening on a host. Uh, but they are the breath, you know, the, 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 the life and breath of most corporate networks. Uh, they, they, they fulfill compliancy. Um, so awesome. Has anyone got any questions about what I've covered so far? I've either done a really good job or I've bored you already. I'm thinking it's a little bit from column B. But the issues that IDS has face is ambiguous RFCs, for starters, which is a situation that shouldn't happen. You know, RFC should be pretty clear, black and white, everyone should know where we're at, should be awesome. Really doesn't happen. Um, we see this in, in networking stacks, a prime example uh, I'll, I'll talk about in a little while. Inconsistencies in implementations. Now, what I mean by this is, um, let's take an implementation like a web server uh, or a HTTP server. How Apache and how IIS do things is slightly different. And there is an inconsistency between those two lines. However, our IDS has to play referee in the middle and has to understand the inconsistencies. And if it doesn't fully understand the inconsistencies, then bad voodoo can happen. Um, Lack of system resources is another great thing. If we look at IDS boxes that are being sold now, you know, they, I have noticed, and I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room that's noticed, when you have an IDS vendor, they will talk about throughput. 
They do not talk about detection rates. I cannot, I cannot think of the last vendor that I have seen that talk about detection rates in a truly meaningful way. They talk about, you know, we're, we're full duplex, we can hold 10 gigabit, we can do this, we can do that. Great, but what do you detect? You know, if I want something to be really fast, I'll get a gold wire. You know, if I want something to detect, that's your job. And you will see that there's some sort of pact, I don't know, you know, speaking off the cuff, it almost seems that there's some sort of pact where the IDS vendors got together and said, yeah, let's not fight on detection, let's fight on throughput. And it does seem like most of the commercial guys will constantly talk about throughput. Well, who really cares about the throughput? I mean, if you're going to buy a box that's supposed to protect your network, is that not what you're interested in? Do you know what I mean? So, but I, oh, but lack of system resources. For them, you, it's hard to analyze what you don't understand. So if you don't have the resources to capture that data for you to analyze it, wow, you're already at a fighting battle. You're, you're already losing your battle before you even start. Uh, and like I say, if you've got a lack of data to analyze, that's it. It's pretty much game over, certainly in a network term. If you have to, you, the problem is, is that protocols, an example of this, protocols are really good, right? There's certain protocols that you are able to, within a packet, tell what it does. Uh, UDP port 53, um, really easy one. We know exactly what's going on in that packet. We don't really need to do much to, you know, a little bit of deep packet inspection and go, oh, look, it's a domain name request. Awesome. However, some are not. Um, TCP port 135, MSRPC. Uh, you're going to need a little bit more than one packet to be able to analyze if there's a threat there. Uh, you know, I think if you run our favorite exploit, MS0867, you run it through Metasploit, it is 17 frames in length before you actually do anything. So our IDS system, to be able to determine that that's not a threat, or it is a threat, we're at least going to need between 10 and 20 packets. So, well, we can really have some fun there. Um, and that's hopefully what I'm going to talk to you about. Anyone have any questions so far? Awesome. So what's the point? Well, surprisingly, I've touched on this before. What's the point? Well, testing IDS systems is a bloody important point, to be honest with you. It's very, very hard. If you think about this in this context, right, you who have deployed IDS systems without a decent order in process are taking the vendor's word. Now, how comfortable does that make you feel? Because if your client said to you, oh yeah, we just trust the vendor, you'd, you'd go mental. Do you know what I mean? Don't trust what they say, do your own tests, prove it, prove it, prove it. Right? But yet, we deploy these systems all the time, and they don't get tested anywhere near the amount they should be. <coughs> and we see vendors oversell constantly. Um, I was at InfoSec last year for my sins, but just, as a, just as a civilian. Uh, not working, but the amount of anti lolsec and anti apt things that I saw there was just astonishing, really astonishing. I think uh, I think it was you actually, Chris, that mentioned that they, I think it was Vegas where they saw the the anti moxie box to stop all moxie attacks. Well, you're doing really good, vendors. Thank you. You make our jobs awesome. So surprisingly, surprise, surprise, vendors might slightly oversell the capabilities of these systems. And, as I said earlier on, they do not talk about detection rates. Um, how many of you are with an IDS vendor? It's okay. We won't hold it against you. Awesome. How many of you have had to deal with an IDS vendor in the past 12 months? How much fun was it? <laughs> Did you get any straight answers? Yeah. <laughs> so, that's not to say they're bad guys, okay? You should buy them a beer, because shit's about to get bad. Uh, but detection rates, they never talk about it. But this is something that you need to look at. You know, we have done some tests with some of our software. NSS uses some of our t software for some of their tests. Generally, we look at standard IDS deployments, maybe five or ten of the top ones. We've run 300 known backdoor codes through there and have a detection rate of 30. Okay? Oh, no, it gets worse. So if we're liberal, it's got a detection rate of 30. This is the top box. 15 of those are misdiagnosis. OK, that's, yeah, we, we, we thought it was hinky, and we think it's this. Yeah, we pay you to be pretty much know what you're doing. 
So if we are really nasty to them, they have a detection rate of about 5%. They have a detection rate, if we're being really nice, about 10%. Now this is where it really, really, really gets annoying. So NSS invite the guys back, they stick one of their engineers with a box, they tune it up, and the detection rates go up to 98%. These boxes can do a job. However, when they ship them out to you, um, they have very liberal policies because it's all about throughput. Because we don't detect lots of things because that slows the network down. That being said, that's why it's important to do some auditing on it. You know, blinky lights tell you it's on, but it does not tell you it's effective in any way, shape, or form. I've got some interesting stories that maybe I can't, uh, I can talk about at a pub level, maybe not up on here, but you find a lot of device owners are not too sure about the uh, quirks of their boxes, and it's those little quirks that can be quite dangerous, to say the least. There is a, a box that I've heard of that uh, will not uh, inspect new network devices unless it's been scanned by the device. So if we put this into context, that's the burglar knocking on your front door and saying, I'm going to break in through that window. Could you please keep an eye on it? That, that awesome. Well done, guys. That's, and I know an owner that didn't know they had to scan a box before it would start protecting that. That's really worrying. Uh, I can't tell you who the box owner was, but if I told you who it was, you'd be quite worried as well. Uh, not cool. Really not cool. And we see this quite a lot. And the reason is, is that when we see, we, even the simple evasions still work now. And I do want to touch on this before I talk about reassembly. This is a rule in snort. Has anyone ever seen this rule in snort before? Do you know this is the third revision? Okay. Why would you have a rule that looks like that? Go on, stick your hand up, someone. Chris. You've got it. This, this is the third revision. So what this does is this looks for traffic that has all these A's in it. And it goes, ah, shell code. Okay, awesome. So three revisions, what did they do? Start with four. So oh, we've got too many false positives. Let's rewrite that rule again. Let's go for eight. Oh no, still too many false positives. Let's go for a couple more. There is now another rule in Snort. This is awesome. That's all C's. That's on its second revision, and it's about four short. Now, you would think if this is the game that we're playing, B would be the next logical step. But no, you guys only write buffer overflows with A's or C's if you're feeling adventurous. That's it. Right? That, woo -hoo. Well done, lads. You really rock the boat. So I, I did some tests recently with our favorite exploit, uh, soon to be replaced, but MS0867 uh, against um, snort. Um, did some tricks with it, and it misdiagnosed MS0, uh, MS0867 as its, you know, as its granddad, MS0604. And I managed to get it to evade without a problem. But for some reason, this rule triggered off, because obviously the POC must have had some A's in it. Well, they did have some A's in it. But what we did for shits and giggles is, um, if you really don't like your system administrator, and, you're run and they're running a snort box, my suggestion is you stick that on a fake parameter at the end of every U URL request. It's not going to be long before that gets turned off. Uh, we could call that a DOS, I think. Um, and you know that D box, that's going to get start to be filled up with all of those alerts as well. But yeah, you can stick that. The, the interesting thing is, if you really want to be a pain in the ass, stick that in your signature. <laughs> Every email, you know, oh, you didn't get my email. Sorry. <laughs> my bad. Um, but this is what we're dealing with. No word of a lie. This is the complex nature of the rule writers that we deal with. The rules in IDS systems, I'm not even on reassembly yet. This is strict pattern matching signatures. Boom. Really? That, that's the best that we can do for detecting shell codes? I mean, we may as well pack up and go home. Uh, and bearing in mind as well, most commercial vendors will import snort rules. Because why would you write your own rules if someone else is going to give them to you for free? So yeah, do expect a variation of that in your commercial box. I imagine you've turned it off. Uh, because we can all see how that's going to false positive.
But there is other things that, that make IDS's jobs hard. Um, and some simple evasion techniques that very, very loosely connected kind of reassembly sort of attacks are stuff like HTTP compression. So HTTP compression, um, awesome. We can use things like uh, chunked. Uh, does, does everyone know what I mean by HTTP chunked? It's a transfer encoding in HTTP. It's, um, it's a very good way of delivering stream media over HTTP, put it that way. But you can do some freaky stuff with it. So what we could do is we can uh, gzip uh, our payload, our HTTP payload, and then send it in chunks to the IDS system. But the problem is with this is there's no, normally when we send data in this way, we normally tell the end point, this is where it stops, this is where it ends, bump. It doesn't really work that way. It has to, you can kind of uncompress on the fly. You can de-chunk on the fly. So, uh, but an IDS system, a passive observer with network traffic, now has a look at a HTTP connection that has compression that's happening in bits in little chunks. And that wonderful box that stops, you know, lolsec and apt and all of those wonderful things, this box is supposed to save you from that. Um, now, take the IDS out of it. That's still an interesting problem for you to have to solve as a network person. How do you, wow, if I want to see what's happening in those packets, I have three different things that I have to think about right now. I have to understand about the protocol, I have to understand about compression, and I have to understand about chunked. So needless to say, Surprise, surprise, HTTP compressions work very, very well against IDS. You know, there is IDS stuff that does defeat it, but what you're going to see in a, in a medium place is you are going to see variations of these attacks be successful because you, your IDS is only as good as the data it's analyzing. And the people analyzing the data and writing the rules as well, uh, if they don't see an attack, they'll not be able to fix it. But the horrible truth is, Bearing in mind, we talk about speed, throughput. Most IDS vendors, from our experience, will normally only inspect the first 300 bytes of a payload. Nice. Because obviously, everything you know that I'm going to do, you're going to know in the first 300 bytes. <laughs> um, we could use some crazy HTTP self-referencing tricks to stick in 300 byte uh, uh, directory name that just gets referenced out before it even gets to the end point. But there we go. Here's some junk data for the IDS to deal with. So there's lots of tricks and pieces you can do here. Uh, really nice. And inherently, IDSs are really fail open because generally they are a passive aspect of a network. Uh, IPSs are a different story uh, and they sometimes are fail closed, but who wants to be the, the vendor talking about throughput that brought down the RBS? because of some network error. People don't want to do, companies just don't want to get into that game. So they still tend to fail open. That's exactly the opposite of what we were looking for. Uh, really? But IDS is inherently, there is a couple of reasons for this. Because they are not an active member on the network, they're not a gateway, they are literally a, 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 a monitor mode. When they fall over, no one knows. You know, it, it, it's almost zen. You know, if the RF mon falls over, who's there to hear it? It's pretty much the case with these guys. And like I say, no one wants to be the vendor that uh, takes a network down as well. But attacking IDSs, the, the process of taking unordered sequence of packets and reconstructing them is reassembly. Ta-da! We can all go now, job done. Only kidding. This is only one technique that can be used. There's lots of different techniques. And when we talk about reassembly, we're really talking about let's make our stream of data reasonably complex and make the IDS work for its living. Surprise, surprise, when they work for the living, things get a little bit hinky. They are devices that do very, very well. But it's in this aspect of testing them that we're able to assess and redeploy and, and tighten up. That's the most important thing. So it's not a great example. Um, it does some form of reassembly. I don't think that's, I think that's me being quite polite. We've had a great lot of fun with it. I know that the new version seems to be quite cool, to be honest with you. Um, but an insertion attack, if you are not sniggering about now, your inner child is dead. Okay. Um, so an, ins an, an insertion attack, uh, I've been reading this for about five months and I snigger every day. And I'm surprised none of you are. You've broken my heart. 
But the idea is to trick an IDS into reading packets that we know our endpoint won't. Okay. Um, so what we want to do is we want to make our stream look different, so that, but the endpoint will see it differently. And I'll show you how we talk about this. But there's two aspects to this as well. Firstly, I, I can camouflage what I'm saying. If you have to see more of a message than the endpoint's going to see, I can trick you, like pure and simple. And secondly, I can really screw around with the reassembly process because I'm going to mess about with the IDS's internal sequencing numbers. Uh, and it's going to find a real hard problem reassembling stuff when it has no kind of grasp about where it is anymore. It's kind of lost the part of the communication. Um, so just think of your data stream as Tourette's and the uh, IDS as taking, the, uh, taking the everything said as, as, as truth. But we can do this with a, a two really simple tricks. Um, so we could use um, either invalid checksums in the IP headers, because surprise, surprise, at the cost of overheads, surprisingly, IDS boxes tend not to check checksums. Uh, well, because there's another like, set of processing, and it's all about throughput. There are some that do it, but bump, massively none. So what we could do, we could take this very, very simple attack here. You know, look out for this very, very simple pattern. It's easy for us to spot. And then what we can do here, I think you probably guess what I'm up to. The the text in the red would be in packets that have either an invalid checksum, or how about this one, or a TTL one hop short of destination. Um, so what happens is the box gets it and goes, oh, there's nothing here. Awesome. Let's it through. If it's an invalid checksum, ah, it's probably not going to get past the, uh, the first router it gets to, truth be told. Um, TTLs, it, yeah, there's nothing an IDS can do with a TTL because it's not an active member. It doesn't, doesn't do anything to the hops. It can only watch. That's all it can do. So it has no aspect on it. But what happens is, is those packets get dropped. They're fraudulent anyway. They're not real. And the true message comes out in the white. And that's just one example. And it's quite a famous example, truth be told. Um, evasions. Um, it's great to be in an evasion talk talking about evasions. Um, but evasions are, if insertions are making a box see something, then evasions are making a box not see something. Um, by far, a lot more dangerous. If you are susceptible to an invasion, an invasion attack, then you are flying blind. You see that e-box that I was talking about earlier on? That's not passing any data up anymore. That's it, done. They may as well pack up and go home. You can miss whole streams. Uh, and we effectively are attacking the accuracy of our IDS box. Uh, and as I say, whole streams can go by unchecked. Really, really not cool. Very, there's very few of them out there. There is one that I wanted to mention. Highly unlikely for you to see it. Great practice of uh, uh, academia thinking. If you find yourself in a situation where the, uh, your IDS has a hinky MTU value that happens to be slightly smaller than your endpoint, uh, you are guaranteed a win here. Okay. It's highly unlikely, but we still see mixed networks, so it is possible. So if your IDS has a small MTU value than your endpoint, we're just going to stick a do not fragment flag on all our packets because you're not going to get that through your MTU. Thank you very much. Let's go home. It's done. You can't pass it into processing. You can't buffer it in. Highly unlikely that you're going to see uh, an IDS with an MTU value of less than 1,500. I would be bloody shocked. But it does happen. It has been seen. It has been documented. These things. If you see this on one of your devices that has a hinky MTU value, you really want to call the vendor up because that, this is old school. <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't be falling for that, but you can see how this works. But the most important one is transmission control box in my, in my, uh, in my presumption. Now, does everyone know what I sort of mean by a transmission control block? Uh, this is kind of like a data structure that's used in, uh, in TCP IP to order the, the sequence of data. Now, uh, data sh generally is sent in a sequence manner anyway, even though it's not supposed to be. It's, the, the, the protocol is designed to be able to handle it. Um, and a lot of IDSs 
used to anyway not uh, uh, not do any form of sequencing because you, you don't really you don't normally see unordered sequencing uh, certainly locally anyway. Uh, but a transmission control block is a structure that's used to organise what's going on, keep keep a ta keep a tail of what's going on, uh, and it's an important factor. The, the TCB issue, well. How does an IDS reassemble data the same way as the endpoint will? You know, it, it, needs to, it needs to take a TCB, it needs to look at the sequencing number, and it needs to reassemble that data structure. So if it, TCB is really, really important, and it gives them a couple of issues here. When do you start a TCB for a connection? Because whatever decision you make as an attacker, I'm going to make you pay for it. One's going to be less, one's going to be more. And, and that's the gray area in the middle is where we win or lose. So this is the issue. When do we start it? There's two ways that we can start it. We can wait for every three-way handshake and go, ha-ha, there's a connection, because that's normally how an endpoint sets up. That's normally how connections set up their sequencing, the, during three-way handshake bump. This is awesome for me because miss that three-way handshake and now a whole communication won't be able to be sequenced because you don't have a TCP bot for it anymore. Bump. It's just data on the data on the wire. It's just noise. The the, the IDS does not have uh, the correct information to reassemble that data, um, and we call that desynchronized. It's desynchronized from the from the stream. Really bad voodoo. This happens. Pff, definitely pack up stuff. It's time to go home. Uh, if you're if this happens to your IDS, not cool. We could take it from the traffic. Well, that's awesome because that gives us the ability to resynchronize if we get desynchronized quite easily. However, both give us two options because we do it on three-way handshake. If I can make the three-way handshake in some way, either dosh your card or do something to make sure that your network is not, your IDS block is not paying attention and misses that three-way handshake, you've been evaded. If not, and you're going to do it on the traffic, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up lots of spurious connection data so that you start setting up lots of TCB blocks and let's see how much system resources you've got. Let's see how long you hold on to that TCB before you drop it. Because from there on inwards I can start to gauge what your, what your mindset is or what your, your configuration is. But we could, if you take it from data only, then you lead yourself up to having lots and lots and lots of TCBs open and having no idea what's going on. Uh, not cool. And really, the I'm trying to keep it quick because I, I know I'm supposed to be finishing soon. But reassembly attacks, when we look at them, are generally making your stream look like two different things, uh, it, giving it ambiguity, which we all know in a networking level is really not cool. Um, in computing terms, abstraction is not awesome. Uh, we shouldn't. Whenever we make a computer make a decision that is not based on ones and zeros, it gets kind of bad from there on inwards. Um, they, they are a fine line between interpretation. And the reason that I pull this up is I mentioned earlier on, I just want to check something, let me... Yeah, it's okay, I'll touch on it in a second. Right, uh, it is about having two different streams in the same stream, okay? I remember earlier on that I talked about inconsistencies and in implementations. This is going to play out in a little bit, okay? But, so, what we try and do is a data stream that has a different interpretation depending on the endpoint that you're at. That's really the best point. So I can make a data stream look like one thing for a Windows system and make it look like something else for a Unix system. Very, very easily. Because there is inconsistencies in how they've implemented the RFCs. But we see this all the time. Uh, overlapping, overlapping fragments are a prime example of this. Um, and in, it can happen everywhere, in TCP, IP, and, you know, so on and so forth. And an example of this is Windows. I was once told that an IDS system has to be like a web server. I said, no, an IDS system has to be like every web server. Because the problem is, is that Apache on a Windows system and Apache on a Linux system, how they handle a uh, character case is completely different. And that's, that's one implementation just on two different, net on two different boxes. You know, that, that, that's it. So when we look at how 
uh, overlapping fragments work. What I mean by this is we send a lot of fragments with the byte offsets that cross over. Windows and Unix, this battle will never end, and thankfully that's kept us all in employment and hopefully will continue to do so. But Windows, if we do this, we send some overlapping data. So we send some new data and then we send some even newer data and say, right, make your decision about which is true. And we ask an endpoint to do that. And bearing in mind our IDS at the same time has to work out, ooh, I have to make a decision here that's not a, not a signature. So in Windows, really nice, they always favor the first bit of data they get. Cool. Unfortunately, we all know that Unix, well, we all know that Windows has to be different from Unix, because uh, I'm not going to blame Unix for this. I believe their stack was here first. Uh, and not susceptible to talking lots of UDP at it and falling over. But that's a different story. So, in the Linux world, I'm sorry, Unix world, uh, new data is favored. So, this is just two stacks, bearing in mind how many like IP stacks are out there, this is just two of them, and our IDS has to work it out. And I think we, uh, it's fair to say that an IDS maybe in some ways should cherry pick, but in some ways if it's defending all known attacks, then maybe you need to kind of man up. But, so what we could do here is, uh, and we're certainly looking at a, a combination sort of attack in some of our products at the moment, is we could send a, uh, almost like a null fragment in the TCP stream. Um, and what we can do is we can get it to, uh, if we're targeting a Windows endpoint, because we very well possibly could have control over the endpoint. It could be a command and control center. We could be very much, or we know it's going to an IIS server or whatever. You know, we, we could know this. So we could send a null fragment uh, uh, first. Uh, and depending on, uh, depending, well, we could send it later, really. And depending on the endpoint, the, uh, the IDS will have to make a decision if that null fragment plays or doesn't play. Is it an insertion? Uh, and make a decision on it. There's lots of things that we could do here. Um, we could use the trick that I was doing with the red text earlier on. Um, it doesn't even have to be a null fragment. So we could put in data that says one thing, and depending on the endpoint, will depend on the processing point. And our reassembly, our poor IDS in the middle, has to somehow keep up and play nicely. And that's just two stacks. And don't even get me started about, OK, overlapping fragments with data, which flag takes precedence over the two packets? Because you bet it, there's inconsistencies again. There's no universal. Once it's a gray area, this is where things get really bad. Uh, and protocol normalization, yeah. You know what? There, there is a real good place for that, and it's important. But until we get protocol normalization on the rest of the internet, that's where the problem is. It's not, it's not, it's not per se the IDS's fault. It can't be in control of every endpoint. It, you know, it can't turn around and say, you should follow the RFC a little bit more stricter. Um, so. You know, th these are some of the issues. I'm going to try and wrap up because I've only got five minutes left. And I know they don't have any Nerf guns or, or anything like that, do they? No, thank God. So in summary, uh, you have heard me throughout the time saying, uh, poor IDS, poor IDS. I don't actually mean it. Um, burn them down. IDS, UTM, whatever you want to call it. OK, long story short is if you keep on telling everyone that we can defend you, your family, and you keep on getting done, at some point we're going to start asking questions. And this nearly happened to us at the LogSec thing. Because all of these vendors all sold this de all this equipment to people. People forget that Sony did have security teams in place and stuff like that. Okay, not very good, but they still, they had products and failed. And at some point, if this keeps on happening, we're going to have to ask, answer some pretty heavy questions. So please, 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 if you're a vendor, I think most people would respect you to start talking about the challenges that your boxes face and how it goes against it. Um, as I said earlier on, it does not, this is the issue. When you say that an IDS has to be like a web server, no. Remember, it has to be like every web server, like every DNS server, like every email server. You cannot get one box to do it all. Uh, and you should maybe look at segmentation if you're using IDSs and say, you know what, I want an IDS box that just looks after email. I'm going to turn everything else off, everything. All it's going to do is packet inspect email. That's it. Um, you can't analyze what you don't know. 
And that's why evasion of techniques work. Um, and deep packet inspection, really? I mean, is this, 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 this is really a coin? I mean, wow, you look in a packet and it tells you something. I actually thought that was the whole point of packets. Uh, but hey-ho. Uh, so if you get someone who's throwing the whole deep packet inspection at you, maybe call them on it. You, you know, you might get your ass handed to you 10 times out of 100, but I imagine that someone's using that term, they're not. Because really deep packet inspection is packet inspection. How, you know, how can you get any deeper than I had to look at the packet? <laughs> um, this is that lovely time where you are asked to give me questions. You don't feel like you have to. I have lots of interesting material um, that I find interesting will probably deal with your sedative requirements if you're having jet lag or problems sleeping or anything like that. I have a couple of awesome books that uh, the PDFs are available. Uh, but please, um, if you do have any questions, you can get me at phoenix at phoenix.co.uk.